My name is Eugene. I'm working on Grappler and performance. But today I'm going to talk mostly about how we do Grappler writing for functions. So functions is a very important part of TF 2.0. It's very important for the end user, how user thinks about TensorFlow computation. So it's not graph anymore. It's a composition of functions. But that creates a bunch of problems for us at runtime. And so basically, we have to rewrite all the graph and all the functions to make it executable and to avoid some specific problems that come with the functions. So this is the, on the left, this is Python code. So this is kind of v1 Python that people usually write. So you define your variables, some constants. You do assignment, and then you want to return updated variables. So if you don't add explicit control dependency, you're going to read the initial values. So you have to think what are your dependencies and have to make everything very explicit. And so on the right, this is some textual graph dev representation. So there's not enough space to put to the full graph dev and the proto. So this is roughly how it will look like if you do to debug string in TensorFlow. If you get a graph dev, do to debug string, you can get some short representation of the graph, something like on the right. So variables are actually var handle op. This is a single kernel that returns a DT resource data type. Constants, just simple const nodes with the values. And then when you do assign add, it is an assign and tensorflow kernel that takes a resource handle from var handle op and the constant and assigns and add a value. And when you do read, it is another um, TensorFlow kernel read variable op. So you get a TensorFlow DT resource handle, A and C. And because you have explicit control dependencies, this reads depends on update A and update C, both of them. And you fetch read A and read C. But explicitly, defining control dependencies is very annoying. So in TensorFlow 2.0, the same graph will look something like this. So you have your variables defined outside of a function scope. And you have a TensorFlow function notation, add and get. So I want to add two different constants, two variables a and c, and get back updated results. So the Python looks something like on the left. So you don't have to explicitly add control dependencies, which make life easier. And you don't have to think about program order. So tf function traces the function, and it has all the necessary control dependencies. So when you execute a graph, you will get the program order you would expect from the regular Python code. So the function def, so the graph representation looks something like on the right. So we have a graph def, and the graph def is basically a sequence of node defs. And we also have a function def. It's a way to group together some subgraph with input arguments and output arguments. So this function on the left from the Python will be transformed to a function def that will be represented something like this. So we have two input parameters of resource type, a and b. And the return type of the function is pair of ints. So the update a assign add, we are assigning the new value to input resource. And then we do two reads, pair of reads. And we have a control dependencies from the previous operation touching the same resource. And this is added auto automatically by TensorFlow 2.0 automatic control dependencies. So we don't have to do anything. And then we have a return values. So we have functions at graph level, at function def and graph def in TensorFlow. They have two types of returns. You might return the data type. So you return two tensors, read A and read C. But also, it has a special kind of return annotation, control return. So it doesn't return any data, but you might group some of your ops inside your function def. And you can specify that these ops have a name, and they must always run. And when you have a control dependency on the function call, runtime verifies that every op that is part of control return set will run. And the main graph will look something like this. So we have a partition call. It is TF2.0 function call mechanism. 
that does partitioning and multi-device function invocation and graph optimization and all the other details that are required for the runtime. And read operations is just an identity that reads the first and the second output of function def. So any questions? Does it clear like the notation on the right side? So in this example in particular, like uh, the read operations already depend on the updates. So in this case, the control dependencies, I guess, are not that required. But I guess in other cases, if you don't return the read values, then those. Uh, no, the, the read depends only on the input A and C. Yeah, but so, it also it has a control dependency on the update. Of yeah, because this control dependency added automatically by TF2.0 at TF function when it trace the function and you have multiple TF ops touching the same resource, automatic dependency tracking will add control dependencies. Yeah, I'm saying like in, in terms of the return values, like in yeah. this case, see if you have the read A and read C, they automatically capture the, so if you, if you try to fetch read A and read C, you automatically you make sure that the updates are run. So in this yes. case, the control dependencies are not that useful, I guess, or are they? The ones, the, the, the the ones that are returned from the function. Yeah, yeah, the control returns. Like if, if oh, yeah. Well, yes. I mean, just, just pointing yes. out that in the, it, it would be more useful if we don't re return the right values, then in, in this case, yes. the control returns would be very useful. Yeah. Yeah, so if you have some variable update, for example, if you have a function that doesn't have returns, that you run your function only for the side effects, update some counters, bunch of counter statistics. In this case, you don't have your regular data outputs, so this is why you have control return. But right now, TF2.0 will add these control returns to both places. This is needed because to separate the data path and control path, because when you inline that function, and it turns out that no one is using output one. So you might end up that you will not execute your state update inside a function. But it is guaranteed that everything on the control path on the control return will be executed under some conditions that we'll mention later. What's that small tutor in front of uh, update underscore a? Like, uh, um, if you see the read a equals to read variable of int a, and then what's that small sign in front of? Um, control dependency, you mean? Uh, this one? Yeah, this one. Like, like why, why it has a special? Yeah, so the data dependency goes by name. So a is a regular data dependency. And this one is a control dependency. So we don't read the actual output. It just means that update A must execute before we can execute read A. Oh, so it's just a special sign. We yeah. Okay. yeah. That's the internal representation of control dependencies in the graph dev photo. I see. So yeah, if your op has two inputs, you will have A, B as inputs. And then you can add as many as you want control dependencies. At a graph execution time, runtime will make sure that everything in control dependencies will be executed before your kernel. That is special notation. So here's another example. So we have variables a and b, the vectors of length 10, and variable c is just a counter. All types are integers. And we want to get a straight slice from variable a and b. And then we also want to increment the counter. Every time we take a slice, we want to know how many slices did we take for whatever reason. So this graph doesn't make much sense, but anyway. And we're only interested in slice one. And the graph will look something like this. We have three variables, var handle ops, constant assign add for the counter. And then we read variable, this one. So we read variables from, this, this should be b. So we read variables from the resource, from the handle, and then we take a strategy slice. And then we fetch slice one. And because we fetch slice one, we can remove slice zero. It is not needed for slice one. We can also remove from the graph A, and that's all. But you see that the nice property we get that slice zero is invalid. If you try to take slice from 20 to 30, in a variable of size 10, you'll get fail at runtime. But because you don't really need slice 0, everything's just fine. As long as you don't fetch slice 0, this graph is totally valid. But if you do the same graph, but you put your slices inside a function, 
So the same kind of thing. You have three variables, A, B, C. C is a counter. You do assign add inside a function. So nice, you don't have to add explicit control dependency. You get your counter updated automatically. Then you take slice 0 and slice 1 and return tuple. And you invoke your function. You don't, you're not interested in slice 0. You, get, you want only to get the second value. So you just skip it and you're trying to print it. So at a graph dev level and function dev, it will look something like this. You'll have a get slice function that takes three resources, A, B, and C. It will have an increment for the counter. It will read the values of A, B, take a slices, and return slice 0 and slice 1. And it will have a control return for increment, automatically added by automatic dependency tracking. So slices do not have any control dependencies because slices they do not depend on variable C. They depend on different variables. And then you have a function call, a partition call to the get slice A and B. And you don't need the first slice. You take the second one by function call output one, and you're trying to fetch it or print it or whatever. And the problem right now is that this code will fail because the function semantics in TensorFlow currently is strict with regards to its inputs and outputs. So before function return can function can return, it must finish execution of all the output parameters. And before function can start executing, it must finish executing of all the inputs. Yeah, so there's another property. So all inputs must be evaluated and must be not dead. Before function can start running and not dead, it means that if you have inputs from switches is switches are used to represent control flow in TensorFlow. So there's a special notion of dead tensor. So it so basically when you run your graph at runtime and you have dead tensors, you don't execute any kernels. You just update the flag and propagate this deadness across the graph. So you can have a large graph and if node that is represented as switch. And based on the runtime value, you execute only half of the graph. So another property of the function is that all outputs must be evaluated and also not dead. So for example, if you have a function with a control flow and you want to take a gradient of that function, you have to return all intermediates from the function and some of them might be dead because they might be from intermediate computations for that from untaken branch. And basically you, your function can be dead. But sometimes dead inputs are okay, so there is a special way to avoid that. And I think it might not be used right now. But before that, when we generated gradient functions, TensorFlow to print all marked all the functions for the forward pass, so that they can return dead inputs. And instead of dead inputs, runtime would return empty tensor and we'll just continue. So but the most confusing thing. If you do this code without tf function notation, just a regular Python function, get slice, a, b, and c, the same inputs, you have doing increment, but then you have to add explicit control dependency because you're not using tf to point out to automatic control dependency tracking. So you will get graph on the right, and it is exactly the same graph as you would get if you don't use functions at all, if you just write it line by line, one by one. And it would allow TensorFlow runtime to prune all the nodes that are not used. And your graph is valid again. But the only difference is that you don't have tf.function notation. And even if I completely remove this counter and I don't want to count anything in C, so the only difference would be the tf.function notation. And it is a huge difference at runtime. One graph fails and another graph is just fine. And this is the real example. So Alex gave a presentation about functions in TensorFlow. And that's how some people use it in reinforcement learning. So you have a function that returns some environment state, does action, and does environment reset. You get A, B, A, C. And you just run in the loop only action. And in the end, you run your reset function. So if you would annotate this function with tf.function notation, on every loop iteration, you will get the state, you will do the action, and you will do the reset, which is not fine. 
another example from TensorFlow probability. So it's kind of. So you have tf dot function that has three inputs. You have like the first output comes from some constant inside the function, constant and some computations. Then you take um, first, second, and third inputs and do some computation, and output at position two and three. And you pass it to exactly the same function, and then you pass to the next function. So we have the first input to the first function is some failed computation. It might be a placeholder that you didn't define. It must be a study slice with invalid bounds or fail to read from the you know, file system. But if you trace this fetch, we're trying to fetch the second value. If you trace across the function boundaries, this one, this one, yeah, we ended up in this constant and it's totally valid. If we try, if we'll try to fetch the last output of the last function, and we'll trace it, we'll get to the second input of the first function, and it's totally valid. So as long as we don't try to fetch this computation or this computation, we don't really need the first input. And a lot of code in terms of all probability relies on this property of the function that the function is not really a function call. It's just some Python scoping language construct that allows you to separate your graph construction. And when people moving to TensorFlow eager and they annotate all their functions with tf.function, it all breaks because function at runtime level are strict. But that's not what it was designed, how people wanted to do functions. So if you open graph proto, and this is the first commit when functions were added to the TensorFlow. And there's very important thing. So the calling may start execution as soon as some of its inputs are ready. And if you want to enforce that all your inputs are ready, you must use tuple. Because runtime is allowed to start executing when the first input is ready. It doesn't have to wait for all your inputs. And the consumer of the function may start executing earlier as soon as that function value is ready. So if you want to ensure that your function has a strict semantics, you must use tuples. Otherwise, runtime is allowed to do whatever it wants and start executing as early as it wants. It happened to be that implementation was strict, and people didn't notice that. And there are a lot of code in TensorFlow that relies on strict semantics. But we don't really want strict functions. We really love to get lazy functions. So nothing is evaluated until it's really necessary, and in current, TensorFlow executor implementation necessarily means that we want to execute the primitive TensorFlow kernel. So primitive TensorFlow kernel is any op, like add, multiply, convolution, matmul. And composite kernels are right now currently only functions, I think. There are some proposals to add more composite kernel support, but I don't know how it will look like. But currently, we really love functions to be lazy. And ideally, we would love to make switch lazy as well. So if you have switch, your conditional execution, right now you will have to execute all the inputs to the switch, even if you don't use it later. But it's very hard to add to the current executor. And also, non-strict semantics is very important for performance. So imagine that tf2.0, we have a function, ResNet. And we have a huge model that does 10 ResNet inferences. And each ResNet has, I don't know, 256 input parameters. So if these parameters are living on remote parameter servers, you can't start executing your function before you fetch all these 256 tensors to your local machine and start running. And then you have, well, it will take a lot of memory to keep them at the same time on the host, on the device, or whatever. And it will take a lot of time until we get them on the network. If, even if we use TensorFlow 2.0 and functions do not get tensors as inputs, so they just get resources and they do read variable op, we still have kind of the same problem because we can't start executing the function before the previous update to that resource finished. So before you can start running your ResNet 50 function, even with the resources as inputs, you have to wait 
for all the control dependencies, so for all the previous updates, to the, all the previous variables. So even if you don't get a lot of network traffic, you still wait on parameter server completing that updates, or maybe something else. So we really want lazy functions and run them as soon as something is ready. Start fetching parameters, running the first layer, and fetch the parameters for the second layer only when we completed the first layer. So we didn't get lazy functions originally because functions were added to the TensorFlow runtime much later than original executor and the graph dev was created. And TensorFlow executor and runtime is super strict, so people often think that TensorFlow is lazy. So you fetch variable A and then you get back and pull only whatever you need. Well, that's not actually how it works. So TensorFlow runtime is very strict and greedy and is using pushes. And this perceived lazy evaluation is just a product of pruning. So we remove first before execution, we remove all the nodes that we don't need to compute the output. And then we start looking at the nodes one by one that are ready, they don't have inputs, and run them and update all the consumers that you already run. And this is the fundamental property of how executor CC in TensorFlow works. And it's almost impossible to do anything with that. And you can't really touch it. It's super complex. It's super performance critical. And adding lazy evaluation is just impossible. So that's why we ended up with strict functions. But originally, even in design documents from 2015, people discussed this problem. And people wanted to have lazy functions and lazy semantics because people at that time thought that if you have some else layer in RNN layer or stem layer as a function, you don't really want to wait for all inputs. It is too critical for performance. But that was too hard to implement at that time. And we ended up with strict functions, but no one used functions at V1. It was a very rare thing and it was not a problem, but in TF2.0, with tf.function notation, we wrap all the functions into function devs. And now we have hundreds of thousands of functions at runtime. And now we have all these problems with strict lazy semantics. And Hansa semantics is not really defined. So different people think different things. What should be the semantics? And what is the right semantics? So right now, we're kind of between strict and lazy when we can. But sometimes it's still strict. So it's a little bit of a mess. So to get back our lazy semantics, one way is to fix execution model runtime, which is impossible without rewriting from scratch. So we might do it later, but that's not something we can do. So the easiest way to do that is just to inline all the functions into the graph. So instead of graph dev with a partition call to the function call, you will get one single graph that is executable and function then the for runtime can start executing nodes as any inputs already. So we don't have any of this function boundary anymore. But you still have to do it very carefully because if you inline it without, because if you, if you just inline the function body inside the graph, you might get completely different semantics. Because some people rely on control dependencies that you add to the function, on the strictness, and all the side effects, visibility, and TensorFlow to point all when it adds automatic control dependency stacking. It has some assumptions about like what is the program execution order. And if functional lining would violate that, it would be a very, very sad situation. So TensorFlow 2.0 Python front end has some function semantics and graph construction semantics that helps a lot to get this program order semantics. So if the function or the immutable state is represented as resource tensors. So the resource is just a handle to a device and some memory location. So you can imagine this is a pointer on GPU or pointer to the buffer on CPU. And we pass resources as inputs to the functions. And if the function has an input from resource A, it will have an incoming control edge from the last op in graph or the last function that has the touch that resource, that has an, the same resource as input. So if you have assigned to variable, and then you pass the resource for the same variable to a function, you will have a control dependency from that assign. 
and if anyone else is touching the same resource after the function call or any other op. TF2.0 will add an outgoing control edge to the next op. So if you pass a variable to a function and then you outside of a function you have a read variable op, TF2.0 will add the control dependencies from your function call to that read. So if you do the read, you will observe all the changes that were made to that variable inside the function body. Um, so TF2, the most important thing, I guess, from TF2 function notation, that it does automatic control dependency tracking. So when you write your Python function and you have some idea what should be your program order execution semantics. So you add one to A, then you add one to B, you think that the A to B should happen after A. And if you add one to A, then you read A, you expect that you see the new value of the variable A. It was not the case in TF1. In TF2, when you add TF.function notation, it will add all the necessary control dependencies. So it will add control dependencies between all the ops that have the same resource as input. And it will also add control dependencies between all stateful ops inside function body. So all your stateful operations will be always executed in the same order. And it will give you some sanity. So if you have multiple prints inside a function body, you should every time observe that prints in the same order. In tf v one you can observe that prints in any order. And that's confusing. And all the stateful ops, basically side effects, ops that can have side effects, they will be added to control, the, to control output. So function runtime and function aligning must respect that. So we don't want to lose any of the side effects or updates to the state. And these are some rules. So all the side effects to the resources that happened before function call must be visible to all the nodes inside function call. And all the side effects to the resources happened inside function body must be visible to every op function that using the same resource after the function completed. Currently, it's implemented. So you have a control dependencies from the op that made some side effect to the function call. And the function call has a control dependencies to the next op that might need that side effects. So to enforce that semantics, Function aligning has a special rules. So it will add a special node, input control node. So if your function call has any control dependencies, that input control node will, all that control dependencies will be forwarded to that input control node. And all the function inputs will have a control dependencies from that node. So it basically means that you can't start executing your function before your control dependencies are satisfied, all the nodes are executed. It also means that if your function call doesn't have any control dependencies, TensorFlow runtime is free to start running your function body as soon as anything is ready. Also, it will add output control node. So this node will have control edges from all the side effects, from all the control outputs of a function. So if for some reason you have a side effect inside a function and this side effect is not connected to one of the control outputs, when a function will be aligned, TensorFlow is free to prune the side effect. Oh, so you might end up with some partially observed state updates. But that should not happen in practice in TensorFlow 2.0, because all the side effects, when you construct a graph from Python, all the side effects should be properly connected to control outputs. But that's not the case with Keras models. I think Keras doesn't use TensorFlow 2.0 automatic control dependency tracking in some cases, or it was not using some time ago. So that might be violated by Keras in some models. But I hope that doesn't happen right now. And also, there is assumption if the function call does not have an outgoing control edge, it means that no one no one doesn't care about what's happening inside the function. What are the side effects? So if you have an outgoing data edge, someone needs the data output. But if function call doesn't have outgoing control edge, it means that function might do whatever it wants inside function body updates, any variables, counters, print, anything, send any data over the network. And no one 
cares about what it does. So that might lead to some troubles, but I think in TF2.0 that also never happens in practice because automatic dependency tracking for nested function calls will add all the required control dependencies. And when you have, when you execute the top level function, you should also add all the control dependencies. But again, it might happen with some models that do not use automatic control dependency tracking. So that's how the function, function will look like after aligning. So this is a function from previous example. So the function takes three resources as inputs, reads variables a, b, increments the counter, then does the strategy slice, one of which is invalid, and returns both sli slices, and control output is increment. So we have function call. And this will be, after aligning the graph dev, so we no longer have function dev, and we no longer have function call. We have just one graph, with uh, multiple nodes. So we have incoming input control node. This is no op. So the function call node didn't have any control dependencies, so no op has empty control dependencies. We read variables from inputs, and we depend on input control node. So any reads from the variables from the inputs will happen after the input control node executed. Then we have an increment increment a counter, then we do two study slices, and then we have two identity nodes for function returns, and we re slice zero for the first return value and slice one for the second. And we have an output control node, and output control node has control dependencies from the side effects inside function, and this function has only one side effect, assign, assign add counter increment. So read variable op marked stateful op, but it is not a side effect because read variable op can't modify, can't have side effects. It just observes the states. So in theory, we could add read variable op to this output control node. But in practice, there are many stateful ops that just reading the state, and read variable op is just one of them. And slice. So previously, we had a function call, function call node, get slice, and slice is identity node that reads the second output. Now we don't have function call node anymore, and slice is just an identity node that reads directly from the inline function return. And we have a, so we read a variable from the counter, and it has automatically added control dependencies to the output control node. So every time we read the counter, we must observe all the side effects that happen to that counter inside function body. And now we can do pruning again. So we don't use return zero, we can prune it. We don't use slice zero, that is invalid, 20 to 30. We can prune it, and we don't need the value of the variable, so we can prune read the variable op. And so we again back to the graph that is valid and can be executed at some time without exceptions. So there are a few more problems. So when you have a function, and you inline function body, and function body does not have any device annotations. You have to decide on what device to place that node. So before TF2.0, we always had single device function. So if the function call node is placed on CPU, all the nodes inside function body would be executed on CPU. In TF2.0, it's too limited, because if you have ResNet in your function, and that function call is on CPU, you don't want to run your ResNet on CPU or you might want to use multiple CPUs, GPUs, or have a function that runs on multiple devices. So there are multiple strategies how to place nodes of the inline function. So you can do nothing at all and rely on placer. You can make force function to be a single device. And we do it sometime for v1 graphs for compatibility mode, primarily. Or the right strategy for multi-device functions in TM 2.0 that all the nodes inside function body must be placed on the same job, replica, and task, but the device might be empty, and then we rely on the placer to place them on the correct device. Because imagine that you have a function call and distribute runtime, and your function call happened to be on another machine, 
and then when you would execute that function call on that machine at runtime, it would be able to choose only from the devices available on that machine. So if we do learning and don't add any device annotation, placer might completely mess up device placements. So if the user places a function call, like a ResNet function call, on machine one, and that ResNet function inside doesn't have any device annotation, and we inline it, and then we run placer, all that ResNet nodes might be placed on completely different machine and GPUs, and it will break assumptions of the user. So when we inline functions, currently we override job, task, and replica, and then end on touch device. So the placer will pick the right device for the node even after aligning. Also have a bunch of functions created in Tenderful V1 that don't use control outputs and don't use control dependencies inside function body at all. So after aligning such functions, you might end up with completely different execution semantics and lots of not might be pruned. What's another fun part of current runtime, that current function runtime, it does not prune any stateful ops. And it is very different from execution semantics of the graph. Because if you have stateful ops variable updates inside your graph, and you don't have control dependencies, runtime will prune it. But if you have exactly the same graph inside function, runtime will execute all the stateful ops. And this mismatch is very difficult to handle when you inline your function graph inside the outside graph dev because you have different notions of what should be pruned and when. So TF2.0 always inlines all the functions because TF2.0 TF is guaranteed to have correct control dependencies and function control outputs. But we don't inline functions by default in legacy graphs. Grappler is responsible for inlining functions in legacy graphs, but Grappler does a lot of additional checks that all the stateful ops has a path to one of the output, that we don't have any side effectful ops inside function body that are not connected to anything because they will be pruned. And there are a bunch of other rules. So in TFP1, you can get function with mismatched deadness, which should not be possible, but that happens. So. Grappler is very conservative, so it inlines only if it can prove that it is safe and it does not change the semantics. And this function lining is a huge source of bugs. Sometimes people think that function lining is the problem, and often it is a source of a problem. And it, because it is very complicated and semantics was never defined properly for the function. So I mostly had to come up with the semantics to make all the tests pass, and there are a bunch of hacky workarounds for different tests. I hope that we might be able to get better semantics at some point, but right now it's super messy. Also, we have a bunch of other functional-like functional ops. So for example, we have a functional if. So this is basically a predicate, and you have attributes with two functions, then and else function. And another op is functional while. So in v1, we have switch, next iteration, and exit nodes to represent while loops. In v2, we have a functional while. So you define a function for the body for the condition, and then you just run it at runtime as a special op. Also, we have a case, something like if with multiple branches. Currently, we lower all these functional ops to v1 control flow. So basically, the if node. If node becomes a switch node and two function call node for then and else functions. And these functions are then inlined, just any other function call. So we do that primarily for the strict semantics. So if you run your while or if as an op inside a graph, it will have strict semantics and some models just expect lazy semantics from your if. It's also very limiting for concurrency. So v1 control flow, while loops, for example, you can run multiple parallel loop iterations at a time. You can run 10 while loop iterations. If you do, if you will try to do that with a functional while, it's just impossible. You have to wait for every iteration to completely 
finish before you can start the next iteration. So a lot of people want to move to functional ops, functional control flow, but in practice it's very difficult, primarily because of the performance, but it makes a lot of analysis easy because we often have to reconstruct what was the while loop from the graph graph, from all the switches, next iteration, and exit nodes. And it is very bug prone and we have a lot of troubles with that. So if you would have at the graph optimization level functional ops, that would help. And then we, at the later stage, we can just lower all of them to switch and measures to get the good performance. So here's an example of how functional if looks like in a graph. So we have a flag, just a Boolean variable. We read a flag with a read variable op. We have some constant zero. So we have two functions, plus one, that adds to integer input one, and returns it immediately, and plus two. So we read a flag, Boolean flag, then we have zero, and the result is if plus one, plus two. So if the flag is true, we add plus one. If the flag is false, we add plus two to zero. So the result will be one or two, depending on the flag. So when we lower this functional if to v1 control flow constructs, we will have the level op for the flag, which will have the zero for the const. So we have a switch node based on the flag and zero. So the switch node has two outputs. It will output the value zero on the output zero if the flag is true, and it will output the value zero on the output one if the flag is false, and the other output, unused output will be dead, so it will basically prevent execution from one of these nodes. So then function is just function call with a switch output zero, and else function is another function call with a switch node output one. So if the flag is false, this node will be dead and will not be executed. And then we have a result as a merge, so we merging results of then function and else function. And one of them is going to be dead, and another one will be alive, and this will be the final result. So after we lower, so this is after we lower if node to function calls, and then function learning kicks in, and you, we get rid of the function call nodes, and we basically have then function return just add from switch one, and else function return add this should be two, and we merging the return values of the functions. Yeah, that's basically it. So that's how we get rid of all the functions. So we have functions as a mental model for the end user, how to, you think about your TensorFlow graph, how you build a program. So you no longer think in terms of graph and soup of nodes, you think in terms of functions. But when we get these functions at the runtime, we still convert them to the soup of nodes because that's what we have to do for performance and sometimes for correctness. Because there is a kind of a promise of tf.function annotation in TensorFlow eager mode. If you want your v1 semantics back, just annotate your function with tf.function and you'll get back a graph. But that's not completely true, because if you have nested function calls annotated with tf.function, you would have multiple function devs, multiple function call nodes, and you'll get strict semantics. And that's not what was the semantics of v1. So the only way to provide users what promised is to inline all the functions and then we'll get back to the single graph with the latest semantics with the pruning and all the nice properties of the data graph. <laughs>